All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on our Facebook Live that's recorded because we told you last week that we are um, going to have this one as a recording because I am currently out of town with my son on a senior trip. So we are recording this one and we um, are grateful that you're here today. We have a special guest today. Um, this is Andalyn. And she, I'm going to let her introduce herself because I myself just met her, so I would not do it justice. Um, so I'm going to let her introduce herself. And we're also here with Ruth. And so just for those that are new here and have not seen our lives before, we are doing a series called Becoming a High Value Woman. And my name is Sherry Brazier, and I am a life and style coach. So I do all things style, wardrobe, all the things, but really it's building confidence, getting to know your own self on the inside, and then dressing for that on the outside and who you truly are so that you can show everyone in the world who you are just by walking in the room. So that's who I am. Ruth, introduce yourself, and then Andalyn will let you take um, some time to introduce yourself and tell us um, anything that you want us to know and how you got into doing what you're doing, and then um, you can just lead us into the 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 topic that we're talking about tonight or today. Hey, I'm Ruth Liebel. I'm from Ruth Liebel Financial Coaching. <clears throat> I help people create a financial plan for the life of abundance that they want. I specialize in helping couples get on the same page. Um, we take the shame and the drama out of money and make it exciting and doable and as automated as possible so that you can think about better things. So Andy, <laughs> you can introduce yourself. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Ruth. A uh, personal plug for Ruth. My husband and I went uh, coached with Ruth and that's how I got connected with her. And she's phenomenal. So if you guys need a good financial coach, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Um, my name is Andalyn Jenkins. I, uh, my business title is Life Coaching with Andalyn. You can go to www.withandalyn.com and see more about my life coaching options. Um, I coach, I, I market myself to women who are dealing with the aftermath of betrayal trauma. Um, and I do that by helping women discover them, rediscover themselves and, uh, rewrite their story. So I've been doing that for, gosh, probably about five years. And then two years ago, a psychiatric clinic reached out to me to interview me for a life coaching position there. And they were like, oh, you're not certified though. So I don't know if we're interested in hiring somebody that's not certified for this position. And that's when I said, I better go get my certification. So I got my life coaching certification about two years ago, and I've been doing this full time now for a year. So uh, lots of experience and finally have the stamp of approval and all the good things. So and she is awesome. Uh, she that's hands down one of like my tiny handful of favorite clients, like of all my favorite clients, the tiny top a Andy and her husband for sure are up there. She's awesome. Well, love thanks her. Ruth. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. The love just goes round and round. It's so good. <laughs> okay. So we're going to late. Yeah, go we're, for it. We're titling this Becoming a High Value Woman Through Betrayal Trauma? Yeah, by rewriting your story. Okay. All right. Okay, and healing okay. from healing from betrayal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hey. So let's jump into it. First yeah. and foremost, uh, the discussion that I will lead here is going to be uh, from the viewpoint of a wife married to a husband and the husband uh, has betrayed a ma the marriage contract, okay? A marriage contract could be written or unwritten. For most of us, marriage contracts are unwritten. We don't really vocalize, oh, this behavior, this behavior, and this behavior is off limits. <laughs> we just kind of assume because we maybe grew up in similar uh, religious contexts or cultural contexts that like having an affair is outside of the marriage contract. We just kind of assume these things. And, um, and so a betrayal happens when what you believe your assumed upon marriage contract was 
is broken by the other party. So the conversation that we'll talk about today is specifically about a husband um, breaking that marriage contract and then you contract. And then you as the wife is left basically with the rug pulled out from under her and uh, wondering which way is up and which way is down and what's even real anymore. And it's uh, scary and life altering. And I see you and I hear you, um, but it doesn't have to stay like that forever. And your experience is very normal, uh, even though it's not something that we readily talk about, especially in religious contact con contexts. If you are, you know, of a Christian faith, which I think, I'm pretty sure Ruth and Sherry both are. And that's where I've noticed a lot of our conversations have stemmed from. So I'm assuming a lot of our listeners here are also going to be from that same viewpoint. Um, uh, I would say that it's even less talked about in those social circles. So just want you to know that uh, your experience is very normal and you could probably throw a rock at church and hit another woman who's dealt with the same thing that you're dealing with right now. So I don't want you to feel alone and I want you to feel like you have a place uh, in this conversation. Um, now, the reason I explain all of that is because there are also forms of betrayal trauma that you could experience outside of that narrow perspective. And these tools will work for all of them. So you could experience trauma from your parents, um, betrayal trauma in this way. You could experience it in your workplace um, and you could experience it in a boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, doesn't have to be married. Um, and yeah, anyway, there are just so many, or, uh, an adult child, you have like a contract for the kind of behavior that your adult child is going to portray. And then you find out behavior that's outside of that contract. So you can experience the betrayal trauma there. So there's just a lot of places in which this will be applicable and where you can feel the same kind of aftermath and that like shock to your nervous system that you experience. But for our conversation, we're gonna talk about uh, sexual, and, and because this is maybe the most common, specifically probably pornography use by a husband that a wife then finds out about. Um, but I've also coached women who, uh, you know, husband tried to commit suicide and I'm using the same steps to coach her that I would for somebody who's dealing with a sexual um, encounter with another woman versus using porn. Like all of it's kind of the same. It doesn't really matter what the behavior is. It shocks your system the same way. So your experience is no like worse or, or you shouldn't be feeling so bad because hey, it was only porn. And I know these other women are dealing with, you know, all of this, like, we're not going to play that game. We're not going to do that kind of judgment. So any questions to start us off, Ruth and Sherry, now that I've got kind of the introduction to the topic out of the way? <laughs> no, I'm curious to hear what all you're right. going to say. Teach us, girl. All right. I have a little bit of a cold, so I'll be drinking water throughout this. <laughs> totally fine. All right. So popping in, we got all kinds of craziness. So go ahead. It's good. All right. So our step number one on healing through this process is going to be feeling your feelings. And uh, feeling your feelings when you're uh, numb and anxious, which is where you're at right after the shock of uh, discovering this betrayal. Okay that's, it's a challenging thing. Um, and so I want to give you a couple of steps to feeling your feelings. Okay. Because, <laughs> because when you're feeling your feelings, this is where all of your power comes from. Feelings are fuel. Okay. Any behavior that you would like to have in your life has to be fueled by a feeling. Okay, so you get to pick what the fuel is that you put in your tank. And that fuel could be bitterness and resentment. That fuel could be shame. That fuel could be happiness. That fuel could be hope. That fuel could be love. And I hope that you can see as I say those feelings that you're going to get different outcomes based off of the fuel that you're putting in your tank. Okay, and uh, so the 
fuel that you're putting in your tank, I want you to get really used to identifying what that fuel is and feeling what it does to your body and to your nervous system. So if you're feeling a lot of shame because, oh, I should have seen all of these red flags and I didn't listen to my gut and I knew this was going on, but I just didn't want to see it. If you're feeling all of those shame based feelings, okay, then you might feel it right here in your chest. You might feel it constricting your throat. You might notice your hands like they start to shake. You might notice your hands getting clammy. Um, you might notice like your face is flushing. Um, so these are the kinds of shame based feelings that I want you to be able to identify in your body and describe it to yourself. Like I just did like, Oh man, I'm noticing my hands are clammy. Like I'm noticing my toes are really cold. And I want you to be able to label those, um, the body symptoms of the feelings so that when you feel it, it's easy to identify, Oh, I'm feeling shame right now. Well, I guess now I know that. <laughs> okay. So we're going to process the feelings that we're, ex that we're experiencing. Okay. And we want to do this without judgment. So what that means is if you're experiencing shame about something, then just, we're just going to feel the shame about that. If we're experiencing sadness or anger towards our, our husband. Okay. Let's go with that one. That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a great one. Let's go about shame to our husband. Okay. Our anger. Okay. So we're feeling anger towards our husband for, because of this betrayal. All right. I am going to then process that anger. Where do I feel it in my body? Okay. Well, it feels a little bit deeper in my chest. It feels hot. It feels, it, it pushes me to like act. I want to say something or I want to confront or I want to run away or I want to sleep. Okay. However, like everybody deals with anger in different ways. Um, but what we're going to do is just be present with that anger and recognize that of course I feel that anger. I feel, and we're going to validate our own experience of that emotion. I feel that anger because, um, because he, he broke my trust. I feel that anger because he just said something that was insensitive and it triggered this trauma response in my body that I'm working on, but right now I'm angry about it and that's okay. Okay. And so we're just, it, rather than saying, and I shouldn't be angry about this anymore because it's been three stinking months and I thought I put this behind me, right? We're not going to like layer judgment on top of our experience of the emotion. That's what we want to avoid in this step. Okay. It also doesn't mean that I'm going to husband and I'm like, I'm allowed to be angry at you. Okay. <laughs> now I'm not going to put any judgments on your behavior because that's not my job. Only you get to decide what kind of person you want to show up as in any situation. Um, but I would encourage you not to act out towards other people when you're in the throes of a deep and heady emotion like that. And instead just process that emotion and processing it means doing what I just talked about, breathing into it, thinking about what it feels like in your body, recognizing the power that it creates in your body. Okay. This is another step to feeling your emotions, recognizing the power that that emotion creates in your body. Um, shame is so powerful and it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, motivate us to do anything other than hide, but it is a powerful emotion. So recognize that like your body is capable of creating these really powerful emotions, anger, very powerful emotion, joy, exciting and powerful emotion, right? So we have these emotions, just recognize the power behind them. And be grateful to your body that your body is able to experience these emotions because it's when we experience things like, like shame and anger and resentment and frustration and sadness and loneliness and, and all of these, what I would call uncomfortable emotions that make our highs even higher. So we have like these low lows and we have these high highs. So you just get this whole like breadth and depth of emotion when you experience the low ones along with the high ones. So recognize that this is all part of your mortal experience. Breathe into the emotions. Ruth. Question. Okay. So any tricks, tips, numbers, whatever 
because the way I understand the way if I experienced shame, shame is because of judgments. Like shame is present because of the judgments I have about either my behavior or um, I observed somebody else have similar behavior and then I judged them and now I walk through those judgments and it sucks. So tricks to going through an experience that is based on judgment without having judgment. I mean, calling a coach thousand percent might be the answer. Yeah. Is there a tip? Yeah. Experiencing shame specifically, uh, Sherry made a comment on this. I can't remember which video it was, but shame is a emotion that leads us to want to hide and want to feel like we're the only ones that have ever experienced it. And uh, Sherry, you sound like a Brene Brown fanatic when I heard you talking about it. (laughs) Um, But the remedy for that one is speaking to the shame, right? And not on a Facebook format. Like we're not talking about getting on Facebook and making a comment about how you feel shame. We're talking about finding a unique and special person in your life that can hold your space for you while you're experiencing that shame. And it's very likely that if you're at the recovery moment of betrayal trauma, that that person is probably not your husband because your husband's going to be dealing with his own shame around the whole situation and may not, I'm not saying it is not, I'm saying may not, you have to judge your own situation, but may not be a person who can hold your shame without like, Piling theirs without on top of not it. being able to manage it, but piling hairs on top of it. Yeah. Right. And then like telling you why you shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> we want somebody that's going to validate your experience. Um, and so a counselor, life coach, uh, best friend. Um, these are people that uh, would be ones to tell you, remind you that you're not alone, that other people deal with this and to help you appease your shame. And if you really don't want to talk to anybody about it, which I highly I strongly recommend that you talk to somebody about it, but you could also do a journal entry as a first step that might make you feel more comfortable and try and give yourself the advice that your best friend would give you. Um, So write out what you're feeling shameful about and then ask yourself, okay, if my best friend came to me with this advice, what would I tell her and treat yourself like your own best friend? Um, Another good way to combat the shame. But yeah, shame is just an emotion that says you should have done something differently than you did, Mm -hmm. which is silly because you shouldn't have done anything differently than you did. And we know that because you didn't do it. (laughs) And you, and even if you, you can't do anything more than, you know, and lots of times you can't know it until you do it. So it's this weird, since we're crazy making cycle, but yeah. Also shame, um, shame is notorious for telling us that we are bad. So like you should have known, therefore you're a bad person. Like you are inherently Mm -hmm. bad where guilt is like, you should have known better and you shouldn't have done that thing. The thing that you did was bad, not you are bad. Mm -hmm. And shame Mm -hmm. really has us like internally thinking we are bad people. Like I am something we can't separate from or improve. Right. Yeah, right. That's why it's, yeah, like, it's just a label that's know. like pasted onto me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's right. a good distinction. I love that. Sherry. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The way I like to say it is yeah. guilt is a godly gift. It lets you know, you've done something against your values. Whereas shame is just like, pff, quit, give up, go away. <laughs> it's very debilitating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It's really good. I love it. I love the shame guilt talks. It's so good. <laughs> okay. So in this process of feeling our feelings, then you may also find places where you need to really not be feeling your feelings right now, but they're taking over. So if you're at the workplace and you like somebody at the water cooler says a triggering comment that all of a sudden triggers all of your trauma that you're trying to process right now, not a good place for you to be processing emotions because you don't want to like start bawling at the water cooler. Right. So I want to give you some grounding techniques as well that you could use. Grounding techniques just means that rather than spiraling in your head, 
and potentially like having a panic attack or something like that. Okay. Rather than spiraling in your head, you're going to ground yourself in your immediate surroundings. So a grounding technique is basically anything that automatically will just like punch you into your immediate uh, surroundings. A good way to do this is like a five, four, three, two, one method. Find five things that you can see and describe them to yourself. Find four things that you can hear um, and describe them to yourself. Find three things that you can smell, two things that you could taste, and one thing that you can, I missed one, feel. Here. Anyway, here. Okay. Well, anyway, you're just going through your five senses, right? And whichever one's easiest. I usually do taste as the last one because that's a tricky one. Um, uh, so you're just, what it's allowing you to do is very consciously take all of your brain power on your immediate surroundings. Uh, another, a few other good ways to do this is kind of the same thing, but like pop a piece of gum into your mouth. And as you chew it, think about the gum chewing specifically and the taste of it and what sensations it's giving you. Um, I, I know some people that like have a rock that they keep in their pocket and they can like pull the rock out and feel the rock. And specifically that one for them feels like grounding themselves to the earth and to the power of the earth. Um, but also, you know, you're feeling the smoothness of the rock, the coolness of it. And so it's taking a very textile, uh, tactile uh, sensory experience um, and grounding you in your present moment. But then you have to remember to go back and revisit that later so that you could still process that feeling because we don't want to bottle up the feelings. We just want to give ourselves some tools so that we can appropriately experience those feelings at a time that's a little bit more convenient for us. Okay. So tell me if I'm interpreting this right, Andalyn. <clears throat> so this feels like a tactic that bombards your thoughts so that you stop from being when they are like, oh, your husband is such a wonderful human being. I'm so happy he's a part of my life. Then you're not like, he's a dirtbag and you shouldn't like it yeah. because he did this, this, and this, and this, and this, right? It just bombards your thoughts. So you're like, ouch, pain or thoughts or words or whatever. So you just for a minute and be like, I'm at the work place. Yeah. Not the time yes. or place. Other than like, don't think about the hippo. Don't think about the hippo. Don't think about the hippo. Yes, exactly. I mean, I remember being a teenager and sitting in a classroom after a te teacher yelled at me. And all I thought was, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Well, of course, what did I do? I cried. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you're in 11th grade and you're stressed out. And <laughs> mm -hmm. so there I am crying in the middle of class. because, And I'm like, huh, if only I had taught myself that I could have like, Hmm, this desk feels really nice. Look at that graffiti. What does that spell? Like I could have grounded myself rather than spiraling. Yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. And who knows what might be triggering for you? I mean, a friend, a coworker might show you like a funny YouTube video and the premise of the YouTube video is about a husband and a wife cheating or some, you know what I mean? Like, and they think it's a funny YouTube video that they're showing you and you're like, totally flooded is the word that we would use for this. Um, and so, yeah, we just want to give you some of those grounding techniques. Um, all right. So the point of this step number one, then, is that we're going to rebuild our trust in our feelings and in our own intuition, because our intuition is what just got like, yeah. okay. So your intuition is brilliant and wonderful. And there are things that you see on this side of your trauma that you feel like you should have seen before and you didn't, but you couldn't have seen it before. You didn't have all of the tools that you have now. Now you're at the perfect place to listen to your own intuition. You weren't there yet before, and that's okay. But now you are. So now is your chance to process your feelings, listen to them, give them a voice, and rebuild that trust with your own intuition. Okay? Which um, to me, that's, all right. that's huge. That's the like, whole thing. Yeah. Like rebuilding trust. With we can end it now. now. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, yeah, we could end the video huge. there. That's the whole thing. Because here's, here's the deal. You're not rebuilding trust with your partner. You are kind of, but for most of these scenarios that I have dealt with, um, 
and that I just see in like everyday life, because like I said, you could throw a stone at church, which we're not going to be stone throwers at church, but you could throw one and you're going to hit a couple that's tear, dealing paper, with this problem. Airplane. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And you'll hit somebody that's dealing with this issue. Like you just will, or that has dealt with it already, or that is going to deal with it in the future. Like that's just, that's just how it is. Okay. I would even and say, it may not be like, pornography, you're gonna but include, it would just, sorry, there must be a lag. No, go, if, if there, if you want to include all the ways that you can be betrayed by somebody, yes, supposed to, like a thousand percent, 100 people, like how many people, their best friends did something or their parents or their siblings. And then the more siblings you have, the higher percentage rate, somebody at work, yeah. all your coworkers, because we're humans and we, we, in order to survive and work together, there has to be trust and yeah. humans, we just kind of suck at things sometimes. And we're going mm -hmm. to break that trust. I'm sure I've broken people's trust. I try really hard not to, I hate it when I do, but it does happen. So I would say a thousand percent of the time you've everybody you've met has gone through some kind of betrayal. It might not be the husband, yeah. but everybody can at some point in their life relate to a big betrayal. Is that that's fair I to totally say, right? agree with you, Ruth. Yes, I agree with you uh, completely. And I think that's why my, uh, my point is all of the work is learning how to trust yourself. Because once you have that relationship repaired, once you tell, like, once you really believe that you will take care of you, that you trust your intuition, that you trust your gut, you trust your desires, you have confidence in your feelings, that they're going to be power for your benefit, the good ones and the uncomfortable ones, right? Once you have all of that, like, trust in your own life experience, you know that, if you're in a situation that repeats that someone else is breaking your trust, you know how to get through it. You have your own back. You know how to set boundaries. You guys talked about boundaries a couple of weeks ago, I think. Um, like, you know, you just, you know how to have your own back. And so that's that rebuilding your own trust is how you protect yourself, not protect yourself from ever feeling this way again. Mm -hmm want to do that actually like this is and anyway we'll get there <laughs> okay <laughs> we don't want to put a big crusty shell on us and then never experience love and hope again yeah right and we in order to do that we have to peel away some of that and be vulnerable but you don't have to be vulnerable yet it's okay like we're gonna work through this together okay all right. Step number two, we'll try and make this one a little quick, um, is taking care of your immediate needs. Now, my guess is that people on this call today or people that are watching this video uh, are past this step, potentially. And the reason I say that is usually if you're in the step that you're not taking care of your most immediate needs, that you're not eating, that you're not getting falling asleep at night, um, that you're not showering. Usually if you're there, you're not on Facebook looking for empowering videos. Um, and so my guess is if you're there, you're not watching this. But if you are and you have happened upon this and as a miracle, you're listening to what we have to say, <laughs> then here is the step number two. First of all, you're in a completely normal space. Like this is grief that what has happened to you just now is the death of the life that you thought you were going to have and the birth of the life that you are actually going to have. And so you have to mourn and grieve that loss. So have a lot of patience and compassion for yourself for being there. But when you do experience that, the first thing that goes is all of your daily routine. And our brains thrive on daily routine. They just love it because it allows our brains to function without having to put in a lot of executive thought. And it saves our brains a lot of energy. But when we're in mourning and grieving something, it's just like it wipes all of that out, all of our habits, all of our routine. And then all of a sudden we have to use executive function on every stupid menial task that we're not used to doing. And so I just want you to be aware that that's happening to you so that you can have some compassion for yourself for not being able to get out of bed um, or whatever 
the result of that is, but also to challenge you and think about some of your basic necessities that you could be meeting as like a bare minimum survival. Um, go and like, if you're lying awake at night, thinking about the betrayal and like replaying scenes over in your head, maybe, maybe it's time for you to go to your family doctor and get on a medication that will help you with some anxiety for the time being. Okay. It's not like that means you're going to be on anxiety medication for the rest of your life, but like, we want to get your basic needs met. We want to get you back to normal, regular functioning behavior. Okay. So if that means going to see a doctor, getting on some medication, if that means uh, setting an alarm clock, so you eat lunch and dinner every day. Um, if that means you're going to have one goal and that one goal is to shower three times a week. Like I just, it can be that small, but I want you to rebuild your habits during a time that it's really easy to not take care of yourself at all. Okay. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. So, um, why, why does our brain do that? Why does our brain do that? Yeah. Why does our brain do that? It, what, like what's going on in our brain? Like nothing matters. I don't know what's important. Like, what is it that makes us do that? Yeah. It, so here's my guess. I'm not a neuroscientist, um, but I do read a lot of neuroscience books because I think it's fascinating. So I'll give my best guess, but if we ever get a neuroscientist on here that wants to correct me, go for it. Um, we have our prefrontal cortex, okay? And that's in charge of all of the like executive functions of our brain. That's kind of the stuff that like separates us from the monkeys, right? Um, our teenagers. ability to, exp yeah, exactly. <laughs> not developed, not fully developed as a teenager. <laughs> that's the part of our brains that like make decisions based on long-term solutions, right? And then we have the back of our brain um, that deals with our like immediate survival. Okay. And when we experience trauma, it's our brain, I believe thinks that we're like being chased by a tiger. Okay. And what it does is it literally shuts off, like puts a, like a firewall between our prefrontal cortex and our survival mechanism. And our survival mechanism says, run, there's a tiger. And it mutes any reception that's coming from the prefrontal cortex, because the prefrontal cortex, if we had that in there, then the prefrontal cortex would sit there and it would think, well, is running from the tiger really the best way to solve this problem? Like we would be stalled, right? Mm -hmm. And for our immediate survival, we just need to go. And so uh, what we call this is being outside of your window of tolerance. If you wanted to write down that, phrase window of tolerance um is an idea presented by dan siegel d-a-n capital s-i-e-g-e-l in his book the developing mind and it's an aftermath of trauma that basically like you have your window of tolerance and like this is where your brain is working properly like your normal person but if you are triggered in your um trauma, then like you might be right here in your little inside of your window of tolerance doing great. Your kids are being noisy and you very calmly and rationally ask them to be quiet, go into another room. Right. But then you get triggered and you bounce out here. Okay. And now all of a sudden you're not inside of your window of tolerance anymore. And you start ex like behaving in ways that are totally based on like survival response. So now all of a sudden you're yelling at your husband when you have no desire. And sometimes even saying things that like, I don't agree with that. Why? Like you look back at it later, you're like, I don't even think that. Why did I say that? Right. And that's because you're outside of your window of tolerance. Your executive brain is just not functioning anymore. And so I'm guessing that it's a similar thing. When you experience this trauma, you're basically just like triggered hundred percent of the time. And, uh, and your brain is like reformatting because it's experienced a death. And so it's like trying to remap all of the things that it already had mapped 
because your reality is now different. And so it's like trying to do this really tricky remapping stuff okay. and it just takes time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, really good question. And actually one that I wanted to bring up in this uh, moment, because validating our triggers is part of meeting our immediate needs. So when we are triggered, like saying, yeah, it makes sense that that triggered me. Of course that triggered me. And that's okay that it triggered me. Okay. And like validating your experience of that. You don't have to like then blame somebody for that experience of the trigger, but just like have some compassion that you have experienced this and that it pushed you outside of your window of tolerance. And I think especially if you feel yourself like bumping outside of your window of tolerance, um, it's important to have language, especially with your partner language, like I need to take a step away from this conversation um, and talk about this in advance when you're not in a stressful state but just so that he knows it's not about him. It's about you wanting to make sure that you show up where you want to show up and not from a place of uh, craziness, right? Like out here is like crazy self and we all have it, mm -hmm. but you, that's not how you want to show up. You want to show up on purpose. And so you want to show up here and this kind of work, what it allows you to do is expand this window of tolerance and get it bigger so that it's less likely that little things will push you outside of it. So, so develop some language around that so that you can have some appropriate boundaries with your spouse that says, Hey, when I'm triggered, I need to be able to step away from the conversation. We'll come back to it within two hours or a day or something like that. Have some language that you guys can resolve things that way. Um, and then the last one on this is celebrate your successes there. So you're taking care of your immediate needs. If your immediate needs were, I'm going to shower this week and you did it, you better darn well pat yourself on the back and be like, I freaking showered this week. Text your friend, be like, oh my gosh, I took a shower. Like, <laughs> We so want you to celebrate your successes because it's important for you to experience some joy and happiness. And if you took that shower, like you rock. That, that wasn't easy to do. And we're so proud of you. And I want you to be it, proud of yourself too. I just kind of had this image. So it's like, it's like a, I mean, it's a, it's an, it's a mental injury or an emotional injury. So even, so somebody has been in a car accident and their legs are broken or whatever, and they're going through physical therapy and they make grounds at physical therapy. If they're like, well, any toddler can do this. Like toddlers should be able to do this. Like, well, I mean, maybe, but you're doing it again as an adult because your body couldn't do it. Like it was injured. Totally. Right. You're like, so right. Okay. Yeah. My Aaron, Aaron got his shoulder replaced. Right. And I remember the first day that he was able to like be out of the sling and everything. And he was like, Andy, look, look, I can, oh, look, I can reach it all the way up here. And we're both like, <laughs> that's totally what you're talking about. It's yeah silly because I would never go up to somebody and be like, look, I can put my arm above my head. But for him, we were both so ecstatic because yeah. you got, yeah, you can reach your, oh, this is great. Yeah. This is what we've been working towards. That surgery totally, like you, your whole arm had to remap the way that it functions and now it's functioning again. That's really cool. Yeah. And that's what, that's what's going on in your brain. Yeah. That's really powerful. Um, I would say if you are three to six months out from your betrayal trauma, uh, from like the initial wave of impact, that's when it's probably like, that should be a good flag to you that you're ready to start introducing some habits back into your life. Okay. And I don't want you to be like, I'm, I'm not ready. And then feel shame for like, I should be ready. She said three to six months, like, mm -hmm. we're not going to play that game. But if you are three to six months away from the initial impact, you might be in a place where you can go, you know what? I would really like to take better care of myself. That doesn't mean you have to fix your relationship yet. That doesn't mean you have to, you know, do anything else, but, but like start to repair that relationship. I think that's a good time parameter to invite that routine back into your life. Okay. All right. So we've talked about filling your feelings without judgment, taking care of your immediate needs. Okay. And then number three, we're going to rebuild trust within yourself. Okay. 
So the most, the first, maybe not most important, but the first step in rebuilding your trust in yourself is for me to just remind everybody that this work is about you. It's not about your husband. So a really important step within this rebuilding trust within yourself is to let go of your husband's behavior. Because the husband's behavior is going to be whatever it is and you have no control over it, Mm -hmm. even though you desire to have control over it. Or he might say that he's, I don't know, whatever his behavior is, like it just doesn't matter. That's that's over there. And we're not dealing with his behavior because he's got to deal with that. Okay. And that's part of his rebuilding trust with you is for him to manage his own behavior according to the contracts that you guys have now spoken out loud and decided what you want your marriage contract to include and not include. Okay. And then he's got to figure out his behavior. Um, That's not your job. Okay. So your job is to heal your own heart. And then once you're healed and ready, that's when. Like he has now throughout that time while you're doing your healing is hopefully healing his own relationship with his self. And now all of those little moments of him healing his own relationship with himself are like little beads of trust that are slowly getting deposited into your relationship. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if instead he's continuing to abuse and break that trust, That's something else that you can address for your own personal boundaries when you get to the end of your healing process, but you don't have to worry about his healing and his behavior right now. Okay. Well, I would say you you, can't, you can't worry about it. Cause again, if we go back to the injury, uh, somebody who has double broken legs can't carry anybody else. No. And, and I know like from my experiences with, you know, betrayal with my husband and different things, but you, you want to control his behavior because it's, it's all about boundaries. What it means is it's the easiest fix for you. If yeah. he fixes his behavior, then you don't have to face all the ugly that you might have to face. Should right. I stay with him? Should I go? If I go, what the hell does that look like? If I stay, what the hell does that look like? Cause I mean, I put up with the same crap I've been putting up with and that's the next 40 years of my life is the same crap I've been getting. Or am I now like, a divorcee with kids and daycare and all my thoughts and getting a new job and like all those thoughts. So the easiest thing is, well, he just needs to fix the behavior. If I could just get him to fix his behavior, but you have two broken legs. You ain't yeah. carrying nobody well, anywhere. No. And Ruth, you used the words, the easiest thing. And I'm, and, and your point is what may seem like the easiest yes. thing. Because the reality is changing somebody else's behavior is impossible. Like definitely not the easiest thing. It's literally impossible. You cannot change somebody else's behavior. You can, you can manipulate people to be better at hiding things, but -hmm. you cannot change somebody else's behavior. So the most important, and usually, oh, this is what kills me. The majority of the couples that find themselves in this relationship find themselves here because the husband's. We're engaging in behavior and dealing with it their own way and really wanted to protect their wives from having to feel negative emotion. And so they hit it. Like that's usually what's going on here. Like they knew it was wrong and they didn't really want to be doing it. They're not really addicted to it. It's not really affecting their day-to-day life. And they just didn't want to tell their wives because they Mm -hmm. didn't want to hurt her feelings and like make her feel less than. Mm -hmm. And then it comes out, however it does, right? And then all he is confronted with every day is how he's hurt his wife Mm -hmm. and how she doesn't love herself anymore and how she's comparing herself to, you know, these pictures of women that to him doesn't even matter. Like, Mm -hmm. so it's tricky because the real, like he's obviously dug himself into his own hole. um, But all he ever wanted was to save you from feeling like you can't trust yourself and that you're not worthy. And so it's important that you do the work to heal your own self because that genuinely is what uh, you need in order to heal. You don't need his behavior at all. You just need to heal yourself. And it's also what, you know, if you're in a loving relationship that trust will eventually grow back, it's really what your husband wants for you too is mm-hmm. to heal your own relationship with yourself. And he feels terrible for having broken that for you. So um, 
Yeah. All right. So we're going to stay out of husband's actions. That's the first step in rebuilding trust with ourselves. Okay. Uh, there are many ways that he can support this healing process for you, but ultimately this is about you. And if you find ways that he could support you, like, Hey, when you tell me that you've looked at porn, I need to go for a drive for until I feel better until I can like talk to you. Uh, which means you need to watch the kids. So that's our new deal. Like if, when you look at porn, you come and you talk to me about it. I need to go for a drive before we talk about it, like, or whatever it is. Right. I mean, that's a, that may not be at all what it looks like for you, but like, there are definitely ways that he could support you. You figure out what those are, go watch the boundaries episode and then <laughs> figure <laughs> out how to make sure you keep those boundaries, uh, based off of your needs and not out of a desire to control other people's behavior. Okay. Uh, then you're going to trust your gut. Okay. This is actually kind of a fun one because trusting your gut can feel scary after betrayal trauma. Um, but the reality is that trusting your gut can, I like to take baby steps in trusting your gut, which is just like tapping into your own desire. Okay. So I am going to trust my gut um, by starting my day and only doing the chores I want to do today, which might not be any chores at all. Like, I'm just going to spend a day. I'm not talking about like throwing your hands in the air and saying, I don't care about my home management anymore, but like, I want, this is just an example. I'm going to take a day and only do the chores I want to do. So I'm going to go in my boy's room and start, this happened to me the other day. Cause I was gave myself this challenge. I went into my boy's room. I was like, I really just want to clean up a little bit. And so I started cleaning their room and I got to a point that I was like, oh, now I'm getting mad at my, my boys. They're not even here. I'm getting mad at them because I'm cleaning up stuff that I like is irritating to me that they didn't already clean up. I guess I'm done now. I'm going to be done cleaning their room now. And then I left. And then I went into the next thing that sounded like it was just be nice to me if this were done. Right. And so I kind of spent my whole day uh, tapping into my own desire and listening to my body when I decided that it was time for me to be done, like conclude any activity. And it was a really fun activity to do because it was like in a very small way with no consequences, it was teaching me how to listen to my own desire and respond to it. Um, and trust myself that like cleaning my boy's bedroom just that much is going to be enough for today. Like I could just trust my intuition on that. Um, so, so that's like a small way that we're going to begin trusting our own intuition. I also want you to view fear as a red flag. Okay. I have a saying that one day I'll write a book about and you can all read it. It's going to be great. I'm sure. <laughs> but, but the title is my God is not a God of fear. Okay. So my hypothesis or theory, I guess here is that intuition is not fear based. Intuition is faith based. So I was driving away just yesterday. Was it yesterday? <laughs> I had to do something at the church and then I needed to go run some errands and my boy was babysitting my younger boy and they're like 10 and seven. Okay. And as I was driving away from the church, I had that like fear response that I know all moms are very familiar with where I was like, maybe I should go home first and just make sure that they're both alive. And like, I had this and it was so fear response that like, my whole life could crumble if I don't go home quick and check on my boys. Right. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go home and check on my boys because nothing about that felt faith based to me. It felt so based in fear. And, um, and because I have this theory, I was like, I, I believe that my God will not communicate me, communicate with me in a way of fear. And so I decided to keep going and run my errands. Obviously I came home and everything was fine. Um, faith-based intuition feels very different than fear-based intuition. So I want you to view fear as a red flag, especially in this space 
when your whole life is kind of living in fear and anxiety because your rug was just pulled out from under you. It makes perfect sense that your brain would be like looking for fear around every corner as a signal to you that like danger lurks, right? Um, and so I just want you to recognize that like if your husband is behaving in a certain way, if it's fear that comes up for you, that's like, you should probably talk to him about this right now. Like you're in danger. He's probably lying to you again or something like that. Consider it, like process it. Tell your body that it's going to be okay. You could find out about it tomorrow. You could find out about it today. It's not going to change anything. But like, I want you to get to a place where you're not listening and responding immediately to fear because fear is not true intuition. Fear is just fear. Okay. All right. So that's rebuilding trust within yourself. We're trusting our own desire and intuition. We're being aware of fear and we're trying not to act from the fuel of fear because I don't want you to have to live in fear and use that as your fuel in your tank. Okay. What I think is interesting about that, Andy, is uh, you can see this a lot of examples, a lot of life meme around. When we make decisions based out of fear, we often end up creating the exact thing that we're afraid of. And that's it has to do with our, our brains don't understand the negative words. Like they don't interpret them. They only hear the commands. Like one of my favorite studies was, I, it was like a driving test and they had red cones. It was like some sort of skinny lane. And they told the drivers, don't hit the cones. Don't hit the cones. Don't hit the cones. <laughs> and I can't remember what the percentage was, but the drivers hit the cones at some percentage rate. And then they told like the other group, like follow the white line or like whatever it is that was on the other side of the cones. Like that was the instructions do this. And none of those drivers hit the cones. And I've watched this a lot in relationships. This is with money and this betrayal stuff happens even with money. Financial infidelity is a real thing. Your spouse opens up a credit card you had no idea about, or there's those student loans I didn't tell you about, or they spent all that money or there was an entire income source that you didn't know about like it. So it applies. Um, but just this idea that like, I'm not going to have the financial situation that my parents had, or I'm not going to have the marriage, or I'm not going to have my husband. I'm, you know, I'm not going to be that wife that my husband, that my friends have like whatever it is. And so, and this is what I did. I was, I have a hard time telling my story because, um, people are still in my life. We've reconciled. Some of us have reconciled. Some of them I hope to reconcile. So maybe when people die, I can tell my story more openly, but I, we were in a situation where like, I just, just, I said, I would never be this kind of a wife. I'll just say it that way. I will never expect this from my husband. And so when things started to like show up that that would end up being my kind of marriage out of fear, I didn't know how to respond. Cause it wasn't like, I will have this kind of marriage instead. It was, I won't have this kind of marriage. So I didn't have yeah. tools to make it different. All I knew was just shut up and don't see it or say it, or just like give in, just do what's being asked of you. So I ended up in the exact same damn situation that I decided as a teenager or as a call, like whatever it was that I made that decision, I will not have this dynamic in my marriage. Um, so for me, that's what I've seen with fear. Like I will not be this way with, I will not have this kind of money as my parents and they do the same. So it's just that, like, when we make decisions mm -hmm. out of fear, we will often end up creating the exact thing that we were trying to run from because we don't give ourselves tools. It's just that, like, don't think about the hippo. Don't think about the hippo. Do you see that? Yeah. Which it like our brains are just so powerful. They really are. And we will always create the result of what the thought is that we put in. So if I have the thought of, yeah, well, I don't, I don't want to have this relationship that my parents had, then in my result, like I'm, I'm always going to have something that points right back to that. And it's going to be like, oh, look at that. And, and what you're talking about is the, the fuel, the fuel is that we bring into that is fear. Now, if I have the thought of like, I don't want to have the same relationship that my parents had and my fuel instead is hope, that's going to lead me to like curiosity behavior. Well, what kinds of things would allow me to have a different relationship than what my parents had? Um, what kind of conversations can I have with my husband that will lend itself to having a different relationship? And why do I want a different relationship than what my parents had? Is it because there's something flawed about my parents' relationship? 
or was my parents' relationship, you know, that's how they needed to have it. And I choose to have a different one or some, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I I could, I could really (laughs) go off on that. Um, But the reality is like, our brains just always want to be proven right. So whatever the thought is that we put in, that's what we'll get as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which just Mm -hmm. means you're really powerful. Like you literally create your own reality, not Mm -hmm. in a crazy way, but like in a real way, you create your own reality. So what kind of power do you want to use? Mm -hmm. Well, Um, isn't that part of what's hard this last phase when you're rebuilding trust with yourself? I mean, I think that's, for me, that was what was so uh, crazy about my situation is like all the things that you talk yourself into and tell yourself, and that's why you can't trust yourself is because like, I realized I could create any excuse. I could rationalize anybody's behavior. Mm Mm-hmm. Like I was good. I was good. And that was unnerving for me, how good I was at creating whatever picture needed to be the picture for me to make it through another week or day or year or whatever it was. Like I was good at it. And that was Mm -hmm. freaky as hell. Yeah. Cause we can, we can create, we can create it. Yeah. We're masters at it. We are creators mm-hmm. by nature, by definition, by godly design. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you want to use your power for good or for evil? Mm-hmm. Like it's totally up to you. And I mean, I mean, for good or for evil, not like you could take over the world, which of course you could, but for good or for evil for yourself, like, mm-hmm. How do you want to treat yourself? What life do you want to create for yourself? Uh, When you look into your future, what relationships do you want to have? What do you want the foundation of those relationships to look like? Mm -hmm. Um, You have all of that power to create that. And so how do you want to go about doing that? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, go for it, Sherry. Um, in, In the work that I do with women, I've seen lots of this kind of stuff um, myself and um, the thing that I, that is so amazing that happens is when we really decide to work on building that relationship with ourself and the trust that we have with ourself, um, we realize that we can go through the healing and the therapy and the, you know, whatever it is that happens or that presents itself because we have our own back. Yes, so it's it less, brilliant. it's less about what, like you said before, like changing the, you know, your husband's behavior. Like if he changed, then I would get to feel better. Right. But we, we can't do that. We can't change someone else. So, but I can still feel better actually. I can choose to have my own back. I can yeah. choose to allow myself to feel whatever feelings I have without telling myself I should have known or I shouldn't have this or I, he shouldn't have that. Like all of this drama that we like to cook up. If we could just trust that we could be sad because this happened, like I can feel sad. I can do sad. I'm going to allow yeah. myself to be sad because I'm worth feeling this emotion. Yeah. Right. And like to remind ourselves that the only reason we're mortal, like we're in a mortal existence is to feel feelings. Like that's it. Mm-hmm. Like we want, opposition we want the good and the bad that's why we're here and you don't have to be any particular religion like many religions profess that same belief there's this amazing book called busting loose from the money game have you read that ruth i wonder I is it it's going on my you, list. you okay you have to read it it's so good uh it's 
anyway, by a, I, I don't, he might be agnostic for all I like, he definitely believes in a higher power, but he's not, it's not a religious text. Um, but it's kind of like a new age view of our mortality. Um, and it's fascinating. So look into that if you're okay. so interested, but the premise behind his whole book is basically you had all power and were super bored. And so you decided to create an existence that would be challenging that like you, you wanted an existence that would make you believe that you were limited because as an unlimited being, you were just, you were bored. So then you got, it was like a bunch of you got together to play a game, like a board game, right? And you put rules in place and the most perfect virtual reality that could possibly exist that, and the, the objective of the game is like, can we trick ourselves into believing that we're no longer unlimited beings? And it worked. And here you are on earth as a limited being and you're just in this like virtual reality game. And so the idea is, can you see your divinity? Can you see your uh, complete abundance? Like you're a divine being. You could create anything you want to. Like you literally could create anything you want to. And so what are you doing with that power? Are you believing that you're limited or are you believing that you're abundant and unlimited? Um, so really fascinating book and it goes along with my own religious beliefs. So I thought it was kind of fun. Um, even though he takes it in a different direction, but it's still fascinating if you like those kinds of, uh, little tweaks to your belief system, then it's a fun one. Yeah. Um, and I think that, I think that's part of the thing too, is you can even, I believe that anything, anything crappy can turn into something beautiful. Oh yeah. Right. Like any crap in your life is compost for some kind of growth and beauty. And I know when I was working through my situation, I would look and be like, well, how, cause my thing isn't just, I want to feel things. I want to behave well that I'm proud of no matter what I'm feeling. That's like, that was my mm -hmm. end goal. Like I have a certain life that I want to live. I realized my life had the real estate. In my life had been owned by so many other people. I had at some time, little by little, parcel by parcel, I no longer owned myself or my life or my feelings or any, like it was pretty crazy. And I wanted to reclaim it so that no matter who I was around, I could still behave in a way that I respected. It took a lot of work, but I can honestly say at least my most triggering people, the people that completely owned me before, they, they don't own nothing. And my favorite part is nobody can tell we know what drama we had nobody else does that's my favorite yeah. part about it I'm happy that the dynamic with my husband that was involved with it our marriage is awesome I know a lot of people don't get that but I even know ladies who other kinds of betrayal they ended up leaving their husband their lives are awesome but just that point that you can get where you own yourself you love yourself, you take care of yourself, you trust yourself, you make decisions that are good for yourself, your life can get beautiful. The details, I don't know, but you can have a beautiful life when you learn how to trust yourself. Yeah, that's so good. That's exactly it. It's you're rebuilding that trust within yourself. You're creating the life that you want on purpose. And then it doesn't matter the behavior of other people. Like, Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter anymore. And I don't mean it doesn't matter like it doesn't affect you any longer because it does still affect you. And you will still find triggers that get punched as you get further and further away from trauma. Like you'll still get triggered, but it won't be like it is now. And you will find that you are more resilient and that you have your own back. And, and you're creating a life that you really love on purpose. And then when you're at a point where you're then deciding, okay, well, who do I want in my life on purpose? This husband that, you know, betrayed my trust. Now you can look at that relationship objectively, not from a place of, I need to leave him because I'm in danger uh, emotionally because he betrayed my trust. 
but I either want to stay in this relationship because he continues to show me that he wants to rebuild that trust with me and he's trying really hard to love me. Um, or I need to leave this relationship because I want a relationship that is built on trust. And he continues to show me that he is not willing to, uh, either change the behavior that we've agreed upon. Like I want to be married to somebody that never looks at porn. Well, if that's your case and your husband's still looking at porn, then I guess you don't want to be married to that person anymore. But, but now you're making that decision from a place of this is the life that I choose for my future on purpose, not from a place of, I want to be married to somebody that doesn't look at porn. Cause I never want to feel like I'm second to pornography. Right. Because that's, that's an uncomfortable feeling. And I don't want that. That's not what it's about. Once you have your own back, it doesn't, you don't, it's not about the porn at all. Like you recognize that the porn has nothing to do with your worth. The porn has nothing to do with who you are. Um, and so then you get to make a decision. Okay, well, what do I want on my life on purpose? And it's, I also it's a pretty think, great place to be. I also think when you get to the place where you have your own back, you can also see clearly that um, porn use is a coping mechanism. It's a coping strategy. And so yeah. if, if you have a husband that falls back into and come out and comes out of porn use, then that just tells you that that is how he's dealing with his emotions. That is how, yeah. that's his coping strategy. And, yeah, and it's suddenly not, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with your, you know, the way you look or the way, like it has nothing to do with that. Like when I'm stressed yeah. out, I go to diet Coke. When right. he's stressed out, he goes to porn. Like it's a coping strategy. It's a coping yeah. mechanism. And so when you can get to the point where um, you have your own back and you can trust yourself and your own intuition and you know yourself, then you can, you can start to see that, wait a second, that's a coping strategy. I have coping strategies. Like I tell mm -hmm. my, I, I coined this years ago with, with one of my clients. Um, and we were kind of just, and trying to make light of a hard situation that, you know, um, and I said, you know, my coping strategy, like my coping mechanism is socially acceptable. Theirs is not. Yeah. Like it's, it's socially acceptable for me to drink a diet Coke when I'm stressed. It's not socially acceptable to look at porn when you're stressed, but there are depending on the social circle that you're in, but yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, and if we can see it like that and we can approach our spouses that way, like an understanding, like, Hey, when you are feeling emotions, when you're feeling stressed out at work or, um, I don't know, like, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever those emotions are, then that is what you use as a release for your emotion. Can we mm -hmm. talk about something that might be a different release that would be more in our marriage contract that would be, you know, more, you know, useful or, uh, I don't know what the word is like. Yeah. And I, I, I see where you I see what you're saying, like develop a routine with them. And I do think that those are conversations that are going to be positive to have in a relationship. Uh, the, where I would steer a woman in this conversation um, is making sure that they're not starting that conversation from a place of, I'm trying to help my husband with his behavior, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And husband might not be ready to admit that it's a coping strategy. Mm -hmm. And so like, anyway, you'll have to navigate that for each of your own individual relationships. But like, if I go to husband and say, did you realize this is a coping strategy? You're probably just really stressed. Husband may feel really validated when you say that, or husband may feel defensive and like, why do you always try and label me with stuff? Like, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I mean, I think you have to decide with your relationship. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You totally. know, what the conversation is, but I think, but I think your point is empowering for object. women to know, go ahead. <laughs> I think it's empowering for women. If you can look at 
that kind of behavior, if you can look at that behavior and draw a parallel to behavior that doesn't feel scary to you and see how it is the same thing, that is empowering. Yes. And I know that <laughs> because I've coached women on this that are like, what do you mean it's no different than eating donuts? Because <laughs> that's my coping strategy, right? Is eating donuts. <laughs> and they're like, they're like, what do you mean? It is no different. It is not, it's not the same. And I'm like, I get it. But I'm telling you, once you can draw the parallel and see how the desire for the behavior and the outcome on your personal life is not that different, you'll gain all of your power back because you won't be giving all of your power to the behavior. You don't want to give away all of your power to the behavior. But I would say that there's other behaviors that you need to protect yourself from. Mm -hmm. I mean, to Ruth's point, dealing with clients that, you know, have a credit card that they're racking up dollars on, there could be a point there where you might need to physically separate yourself in, in a way that protects you from the aftermath of that behavior. Um, you might be in an abusive situation where you need to protect yourself from that behavior. You might be in, uh, I, I, one of my clients is, uh, has a husband who has a couple of times tried to commit suicide. And so for her, like, I'm not going to tell her that his suicide attempts are the same as eating donuts. Um, but he does have coping strategies that often lead to, uh, or have been triggers for that behavior. So drinking might be one for him that I'm going to try, like he, she's trying to develop her trust again when he has a drink in his hand. And so it's like, okay, if you're really trying to develop trust on this, then we need to see how drinking can be the same as eating the donuts. Right. And so anyway, it's tricky and it's nuanced. Um, but ultimately if their behavior is not literally destroying their lives, right. Or like putting your family in financial ruin or, hurting you or themselves, then there might be some parallels that we could draw to other behaviors that are socially acceptable that do not destroy lives either, but that are coping mechanisms. I think that's a really valuable line to draw. Yeah. All right. Well, Would we you, are, we I are said. out of time. We've got, we could, we could just keep This on. was so good. We could just keep going. We could, we could. And, and if you are open to coming back, on another live, if we do have some people that have some questions and stuff, we would consider that too, if you're open to it. Um, is there anything, in the, if, is there anything that you had for us today that you didn't cover that you would like to cover or did we get everything? Um, I think ultimately just to wrap up, love is based in hope. Like love is all hope. That's all the feeling of love is. And when you are betrayed, that hope gets like whopped to the side. And then it's very difficult to feel that love again. And as you start to rebuild that hope for yourself, that's when love can start to blossom again. And you can start to be vulnerable again and rebuild that love. So just understand that things that used to bring you a lot of hope may be difficult to feel. Like you might pray and if you're used to praying in one specific way for the rest of for like the whole previous part of your life, you may find that that way of praying doesn't work anymore. You might need to be a journaler now, like to feel that same kind of hope that you felt before, because that hope is getting deconstructed. And I don't want you to fear that deconstruction. I want you to understand that it's normal and that your job is going to be to reintroduce things in your life that bring you hope. Uh, for your future, because your future is going to be brilliant and beautiful. And this is a refiner's fire and you can totally walk through it. And you have lots of support and lots of resources to walk through it. You can, um, but it'll be by reforging that hope that love will be able to blossom in your life and in your relationship. If you choose to stay in your relationship, which I fully support. So that's all for me. Um, I do have a little Marco Polo share cast 
that I created. It goes into what we talked about here, but in 10 steps rather than the three that we discussed today um, and goes into more detail. So I could put that link to the yes, Marco Polo Sharecast. And if you guys wanted to look at that more, you could. And I yeah. offer free 30 minute initial sessions. So, and there's no uh, pressure there to continue working with me as a coach. I do cap you at 30 minutes. Um, but, uh, but I have some really good conversations that way. And then you can learn about more about how you could work with me one-on-one. -on -one. So, okay. Thanks, awesome. Guys. Um, if people want to follow you, where do they, where do they go to follow you? With Andalyn. Uh, so it's with Andalyn.com. It's with Andalyn on Instagram. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, thanks. Andy. You're awesome. Thanks for coming on. We just uh, really thanks, appreciate guys. it. This is a, this is a so very, fun. very, very important topic, a very, very important topic. And, and I want to get, um, as many resources out to women as we can of people who are safe for this conversation, because I think it is something that, um, most women are dealing with on some level, whether it's their husbands or their kids or, uh, you know, a dad or a brother-in-law or a sister-in-law, or, I mean, it hits women too. I it's think everybody that, like, yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Yep. I think all of us have, um, somebody that we know that's close to us, whether it's happening in our own families or not. Um, some, we all have somebody that is close to us that is struggling. So, um, if you are watching this and you are having struggles with this, um, please reach out to one of us. Um, Andalyn is definitely a person that can help you work through it. Um, Ruth and I are safe places as well. So if you need a safe place, you can reach out to any one of us. So um, thanks for joining us, um, Andalyn. Thanks everybody who is watching and we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye.